We have a talk coming up. We're running a little bit behind, so I'm not going to introduce this man too long, except to say that he is the greatest Canadian who ever lived. He was actually born a Mountie in Canada. That's not a thing that happens very often when you're born with your horse and your sword. Um, <laughs> his name is Adrian. He's from Seattle. He works for a company called Well Talk. Let's see if he talks well. Round of applause, please. Hi, I'm sorry about that introduction. Um, I'm actually from Seattle, not Canada, but real close, you know. Um, it's pretty good. And I, oh uh, yeah, go, go Canadian, eh? Um, so my talk is about uh, deployment nirvana, uh, and it's kind of some of, the, um, some of the issues, some of the challenges, and some of the stuff that we learned at a company called Moz, uh, where I built a lot of deployment infrastructure for our SOA app. Um, Conveniently enough, uh, everybody this afternoon has been talking about services and, uh, and why they are amazing and they're terrible at the same time. Uh, so it's been really a great, great lead-in. Um, so first of all, um, the web definitely as we build it is changing, right? Um, we're moving more and more from these big, giant, monolithic apps, uh, and we're starting to split them up into services. And so this actually reflects back on some of the stuff that we used to do in like the 90s with um, a lot of the ways that we would factor out large enterprise apps. Um, but now we're starting to do it, uh, and we're breaking it into these little monolithic apps, or these little small apps uh, that communicate over HTTP or NSQ or any sort of message broker or a bunch of different ways. Um, and so we're starting to split them out onto this. And so it's actually not for scaling performance-wise, right? So a lot of times we'll talk about like, oh shit, we've got to you know, break out this monolith because it doesn't scale or it's too slow or any of these reasons. Well, it turns out that stuff like this is really, really, really cheap um, compared to you know, stuff like this. People are really expensive. And it turns out that there's a bunch of cognitive load and you can't just throw more people at a problem. I mean, I mean you know, we all know that we can get you know, a baby in one month um, if you just throw out nine women at the problem, right? Like, it's, it's, the, it's the way that nature of the system that we work in that, um, you know, as teams grow, your productivity doesn't necessarily grow alongside. Um, so, again, what, with this, with our movement to SOA, microservices, whatever the, you know, the current term that we want to use is, um, what's happening is what used to be a very complicated app, very complicated piece of software um, that was nice and easy to deploy onto your Commodore 64, um, it's now starting to become all of these individual little apps, and we have to deploy them. We have to deploy them separately. We have to coordinate them separately. We have to worry about how they intercommunicate. We've got all of this extra stuff, this extra cognitive load that we have to understand. Um, and so the problem that I attacked at Moz, uh, and that we're going to be talking a little bit about today, uh, and uh, I'm going to be tackling for a while in the future, uh, is how do we do all of this? How do we deploy 40 services, um, and how do we do it in a way that makes life easy for developers? Um, as an engineer, I don't want to think about what happens when John bumps a service and blows up the world, um, because why should I have to think about that, right? We've got versioning, we've got tests, we've got ways that we can, we can, we can solve this problem. Um, so, hi, I'm AJ. Oh, that's not it, hold on. That's closer. Um, but also, there's my space reference, Jonan. You're welcome. Um, hi, I'm Adrian. Uh, so uh, let's see here. So I was at Stride for a while, which was uh, a startup that I had with, with a few guys. Uh, then I went to Moz, um, and that's actually where I learned a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about now. Uh, now I'm at a company called WellTalk. Um, basically, I am writing code and leading teams and doing all of, that, all of that stuff that we do and get paid for, and we have a pretty darn good time doing it, actually. Um, so we're going to rewind a little bit to when I was at Moz, and this was about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, so we wanted to build a software. Uh, it was this glorious, wonderful Greenfield app, right? And so we all sat down, and we actually had some pretty smart folks on the team. We had a couple of ex-Google guys. We had a couple of extremely brilliant, um, fresh out of college folks. Uh, we had, you know, I was the anchor just kind of dragging everybody down, but um, I could help people laugh, so that was good. 
Um, so we basically looked at the problem, uh, and we built this tool called Moz Local. Um, so Moz Local was primarily, and is still primarily, hopefully, <laughs> I hope it still runs. Um, it's primarily about transforming API data, right? So the core of the problem and the core of the app was that, let's say that um, I'm a small business owner and I want to make sure that my small business listing is up to date and correct across, say, Yelp, Super Pages, Foursquare, I guess it's now Swarm, um, Facebook, all of that stuff. And so we had to work with all of these APIs. Uh, and it turns out that a lot of the APIs we were streaming and we had a lot of concurrent connections running. So. Um, Node.js actually looked like a pretty, a pretty convenient, good way for us to build it. Um, because you know, we were doing a ton of parallel I.O., because there wasn't really a ton of business logic involved. It was mostly just taking these external APIs, manipulate them, normalizing them. Um, we decided to do it in Node. Uh, and because of that, also, we decided to do it as a large pile of independent services. Um, part of this was just because it made sense uh, from the specific app, and part of it was team scaling. Um, so, you know, when we thought about why we were going to do a service-oriented app or a microservice app versus not, um, we thought a lot about team scaling versus performance scaling. Um, by breaking it out into separate services, we were able to minimize the cognitive load for anybody. I didn't have to understand the entire app. I didn't have to understand how our caching layer worked. All I had to know is that as a consumer, as a user of it, I would just interact with it with the published, well-defined API contracts that we would give internally. Um, you know, I mean, it's very similar to stuff where we, would, where we would have internal APIs where things would be well-defined, what's public, what's private, what's, you know, all of this stuff. We don't really do it very well anymore. Uh, we just, a lot of times, can just hack and slash out some code. Um, so it was a lot about minimizing the cognitive load, and it was also about composability. Um, so I touched a little bit, we had like a caching layer, and we had a lot of interactions where we would work with an API and think of it as a stream, so we could compose together a couple of different services. Um, so all this stuff is looking pretty good for us right now. Well, and then we kind of thought about why not service-oriented architecture. Um, so there were some complex interdependencies uh, in that services relied on each other, right? Like our, we had a service that encapsulated our data persistence layer, which underneath it, there was Cassandra, there was Postgres, there was a little MySQL, there was some Redis. We don't really want to talk about it, um, which was great as a, as a developer, as an engineer. I didn't have to think about any of that stuff. It was just taken care of for me by uh, this service, but you know, it's very complicated. Uh, we had some reliability issues, which I'm gonna touch on in a second. Uh, debugging it was nigh impossible. Um, you know, I see an exception and I have to unwind the entire service stack of like how this request bounced through 15 services. That was really painful. Uh, the tool chains were non-existent. Um, so like, this was one of those things like, uh, uh, Foreman is a tool now that is very good and is helping us with some of the stuff, but it's still hard. Right? It's still hard to coordinate 15 odd different services or 20 or five or however many we're working with. It's hard to do this in a development environment and think about it well. Uh, integration testing was one that was really painful and um, the really subtle foreshadowing deployment was hard. Um, so you know, we made the call uh, and we decided to go with, uh, with service-oriented architecture. Um, so we got to work. Um, this was basically our, our look on all of our faces as we started to get further and further into, into the madness. Um, and you can get that photo real quick then, because three, two, one. Okay, so first of all, uh, we were using a tool called Circus, uh, which I don't know if anybody here is familiar with it. Uh, it's basically a process manager that allows us to run N processes or services or what have you uh, underneath it. Don't ask why we're using it instead of like, you know, init D or any of the nor upstart, run it, any of, them, any of the ways to do it. But, this was the tool we decided to use. Um, we also had this thing called collateral flapping, which I'll touch on in just a second. Uh, deploys resulted in downtime uh, and service level versioning. Again, one of those subtle, subtle foreshadowing things. Uh, so Circus was our first problem, and I'm gonna call it problem zero, uh, because it wasn't even a problem for us. Before we actually even went live, before we launched, we just killed it and replaced it. Um, so the lesson from that one was always vet your tools before you deploy, before you go live. Um, because you can actually get yourself in a little bit of trouble if a core part of your infrastructure just straight up doesn't work for you. Um, so the next one was we had the collateral flapping issue. Uh, so because we sucked at Node and we didn't know what we were doing, um, because domains were super confusing, uh, for us, again, point one, we didn't know what the heck we were doing, um, basically what would happen is, say we've got five concurrent requests coming in through this Node service and one of them crashes, well, we weren't doing a really good job at catching those exceptions, so all five of them would just die. Uh, so a lot of people would get 500s or broken sockets or any of those really painful things. So, well, so what we did 
because we solved it. Um, we built a service registry and an HTTP proxy, uh, you know, the simplest way, of course, to solve a crashing problem. Uh, we built a service registry and an HTTP proxy, and we ran multiple instances of a given backend. Uh, we were able to do some kind of cool stuff where if we haven't sent any bytes back down on the wire and we're not that far along on a timeout, if one backend goes down, we just transparently use another one. The end user doesn't even have to know that you know, they killed a backend. They don't know. Um, so the second one was we had deployment downtime. Well, aha, we've got a port registry now. So we fire up a new background, a new backend. It'll register itself with our port registry. Uh, and then we basically just cleanly reap all the old backends. And the, the HTTP proxy just cuts traffic on over. Um, so now we've got this interesting pile of stuff um, these three separate home-rolled, loosely coupled tools uh, called DMV. Um, that was our proxy, because we all know how efficient the DMV is at routing requests. Um, we had Seaport, uh, which was our port registry, which we eventually replaced uh, with a tool called Portland. Um, Portland, of course, was uh, some fair trade, free range port registry services. Uh, we had a lot of... Um, the README was literally nothing, just but a bunch of hipster jokes, so that was pretty fun. Uh, and then Viaduct. Uh, Viaduct was our new, uh, our new service registry and our new process manager, because we all know that the Viaduct's never going to go down. <laughs> uh, so the laugh there, for everybody who doesn't know, is there's a Viaduct in Seattle that um, it's been going to go down in the next big earthquake that we have for like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, so now we're trying to cut a new tunnel underneath it, uh, and that's also gone really bad. So we're like $5 billion now to try and like cut a tunnel that's going to you know, save everybody in the next earthquake, but it'll probably just flood. Um, so that was Viaduct. Uh, so it was the greatest thing ever, right? We've got these great, awesome tools. Um, they shield us from ourselves when we write bad software and it crashes. We've got zero downtime deploys. We've got all kinds of controls. So we can do some really interesting stuff now that we've run the code for our routing layer. Um, we can do some fun stuff around versioning, and we can do some fun stuff around um, cutting over traffic to different users and all kinds of stuff. Well, it's also the worst thing in the world. Um, so client tooling, we didn't really have any. Uh, our deploys basically revolved around our intern. Um, he was really good at fast at typing out a pile of commands that sometimes changed a little bit. Everyone's, nobody really understood it. It was bad. Um, we fixed that. But so the client tooling was really bad. Uh, development was really, really bad. Uh, again, because we had to run 10 services, uh, and you have to run, say, oh, I don't know, like Postgres and Redis, um, and another Redis on a different port, and you've got to make sure that your Cassandra instance actually has two services, otherwise it's not going to fire consensus, and things aren't actually going to get stored. Ton of pain. Um, so that was kind of lame. Uh, we have made it better. It got better. Uh, but the really interesting one, though, is that inter-service versioning which is when you've got service A and service B and service C, um, the versioning between them was kind of unsolved. So service versioning, which was actually touched on on the last one with Pliny, um, it's pretty much a solved problem, or so we, say, or so we think. Uh, we've got all kinds of ways that we can call for a version on a service. We've got, you know, we can do, do it in the URL, we can do it as a query param, we can do subdomains, we can do, um, we can do what Foursquare does, which is they have a timestamp, which is actually really cool. You include the timestamp of, uh, um, of when you want this request, the time of the code that you want this request to run against. Uh, and so they like sunset stuff after it's been a few months. It's pretty darn cool. Um, so the problem is, is that um, as an engineer, I have to start thinking about this, right? So I have to think both writing and consuming a service about versioning. Um, we're never going to be able to get rid of both, but we might be able to get rid of one. So whenever I make a commit, um, I get back a SHA, uh, assuming I'm using Git or any other you know, good version control system. I get back some reference to this code at a point in time, which is really similar to what a version is, if not exactly what a version is. Um, so we thought about this um, because we were starting to have issues with all of our different services and deployments and what versions we're talking to what. Um, so we thought about, like, is there anything that we can do here? Like, are we able to actually use Git SHAs as our versions? Uh, and so it turns out we can, um, partially because of the tooling that we had up, up, up ahead of us, uh, and partially just because we built a little bit more stuff. Um, so we've got this HTTP proxy. Uh, I mean, it's, it's our own custom co code. We can do all kinds of stuff with it. 
Um, so basically what we do is we extend it to route to specific Git SHAs on a service, and we consider that as a version, right? Um, so we include it as an HTTP header or something else. Um, you know, we are, we're also having service intercommunication via NSQ, which was our message, uh, message queue. So again, we would include the SHA, and we would say, hey, look, I want to talk to the service, and let's call this, you know, service A at this Git SHA. Um, and so we'd actually keep them running long enough, and we'd have, uh, we were measuring traffic to individual backends, so we would know when traffic got cut away from it, and we would just reap that backend. Um, and so we also can do things with the domains, right? Um, so we can say that production goes to this, this Git SHA, right? And we can say that staging goes to this Git SHA. So we've got all of a sudden getting a lot of power with our versioning. Uh, as an engineer, I don't have to think about versioning. I don't have to write versioning into any services. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's doable. There's lots of great libraries to do it. But we're at this point right now in engineering that we can build amazing tools and amazing abstractions. So any way that we can make our lives and our colleagues' lives easier, we should probably do it. So there are obviously some advantages and some disadvantages here, right? So uh, as an engineer, I don't have to really think about or build versioning. That's good, right? I know that. Um, this software that I'm writing every time I make a commit, uh, I have a version given back to me by the tools that I'm already using. Uh, another one that I can do is we can test multiple releases simultaneously, right? So branches have SHA, or you know, commits on branches have SHAs, so we can basically, if we have control over the routing layer and where our requests are going when, um, we can split them off. And so I can fire off a spike, I can get back a SHA, I can throw it up into our uh, hosting service, our hosting layer, um, and then I can cut some traffic over to it on a, on a custom domain, or say I can give out that SHA to other engineers or, or marketing or anyone inside or outside of the company, and it just rattles through the routing layer and finds its way to my new services. Um, there are some challenges, obviously. Outside of build, building all of the tooling, um, there are some restrictions that we had with the, with the Git SHA-based route or versioning. So, our deployed services have to be reflective. Um, so what that means is that a service has to know what its SHA is. And a lot of times, when you release code, it's not, right? Um, a lot of times, we'll do some sort of tarball, we'll do some sort of archive, we'll use Capistrano, we'll use any of a number of different deployment methods. And a lot of them aren't going to give us uh, any information on what the SHA is or what the snapshot in time is. It's fine. We can tool up around that as part of the deployment process. But you know, it's still something. Um, another one is that we have to run multiple instances of a given service, right? So this doesn't work really well for memory-hungry apps, right? So luckily we had, I think, one Rails app uh, in play, and so that used, you know, a couple hundred megs of memory. Um, but we had, you know, like a couple hundred little node services rattling around, uh, and they shared a lot of memory together, and, you know, and this is on a given server, right? So we were able to run, we were able to run it because of the system and the tooling that we were using to build it. And so the last big problem that we kind of fought uh, and that we kind of worked around discovering was inter-service versioning. Um, so that's really where things start to get interesting and exciting and really challenging. And nobody's actually really publicly solved this stuff yet. Um, so like, let's say that we've got service A and we've got service B. Um, let's say that like service B is some sort of uh, database persisted service wrapping you know, any number of, any number of persistence layers, like maybe like a, I mean, I don't know, let's say we've got Cassandra and Redis and Postgres in play, um, and we're using each one for different, for different purposes, right? You know, Cassandra's super right, super, super good at writes, and Postgres gives us relational queries, and Redis gives us some flexibility in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of data stores. So, they might need a change in lockstep, and so this actually bit us a number of times before we came up with our inter-service versioning. Um, if, say, we bump B, and we don't necessarily think about it, because kind of as an engineering team, we have stopped really thinking about versioning, pros and cons, of course. Um, if they don't change in lockstep, uh, or if there's no communication across teams, which is another one of those things that harkens back to uh, team growth, um, I might break things. You know, I might bump version B, and all of a sudden this was like an integer last time, and now it's a string that's a number. Things that happen, especially when you start playing with JavaScript, um, things that happen can break the world, and it kinda, it's not good. Um, so how do we change these in, in lockstep? Um, so basically what we did, uh, and again, this was all through tooling and all through um, 
uh, all through services and routing layers and, and I hesitate to call it magic, but there was some, there was some, some shady stuff going on under the hood. <laughs> um, basically what we do is we built a release version, right? So we've got A and we've got B and we've got A and we've got B prime, right? And so even though um, nothing's changed in A, uh, our application, which is this collection of all of our services, has changed. And it's an entirely different application, right? Um, from the perspective, you know, ignoring the hosting layer, right? Because we're, we're thinking at a layer that, let's just pretend that we've got all of the resources that we could possibly want in terms of compute power, assuming we're able to utilize them effectively, like say some sort of collection of giant data centers that we can use on an hourly basis and scale up and scale down. I don't know, data centers, you know, Heroku maybe, I don't know. Um, so basically, in a perfect world, we wouldn't have to have separate A's running, we wouldn't have to have separate B's, you know, et cetera, et cetera, but from the perspective of a consumer of our API, whether it's internal, whether it's external, whatever, these are separate applications. So we tooled up around this stuff, right? So at deploy time, we would build a, uh, what we call a release version. Uh, and so the release version encapsulates every single service that we're about to deploy and what it depends on, uh, all of its versions, uh, and then we do an internal mapping between all of them, right? So when I ask for service B at V2, that's gonna give me the SHA of B prime. Um, it works really well, actually. Um, it's a lot of wackiness, but uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, we have some downsides, though. So we have to figure out some way that our services are able to correctly request versions. They don't necessarily have to think about hosting the right version, but they certainly have to think about it from the consumption perspective. Um, so like say, uh, I mean like if we roll back to this slide real quick, um, when A makes a request to B, right, it's got to be aware of what its version is. So it knows whether it's asking for A at V1 or A at V2. Um, so there were two ways that we can solve this, and we did solve this two ways. Um, we did it, <laughs> solved it two ways, the first one sucking and the second one being amazing. Um, so the first one we did was we literally would just run separate versions, right? And at deploy time, when we encapsulated everything, when we bundled it all up, we would say, this is your SHA, this is what you request. Yeah, the problem is, is that despite having tons and tons of, say, um, AWS capability and tons and tons of, of different, different uh, computing resources at our, at our disposal, Running five separate services that are all exactly the same is kind of wasteful, and it kind of it kind of sucked. So the second way we did it, uh, and this is the way that it's still running now, uh, is each service actually carries through um, its tag, right? Um, so like, let's say that we've got um, we have a node app, right, and it gets a request coming in uh, that that major release version gets carried through to every request, and so everything rattles through our routing layer. Uh, which gives us a couple of really interesting benefits. Uh, we have really good metrics on the routing layer, so we can watch traffic. Uh, because of watching every single uh, request go around inside the routing layer, uh, all of a sudden we can debug now, right? So whereas before, like, you roll into a black box and a request might bounce around through five, ten services, uh, now we can actually replay all of those traces. Um, so this is all getting pretty good for us, right? Um, so again, there are, I mean, I guess there are three ways, right? Uh, as an engineer, I can think about it, which like, we don't want to make ourselves think. We don't want to make our colleagues think. As you know, people building internal tools, internal services, people handling operations, we want to make it so that our users don't have to think about it, right? You know, I mean, if we were building an app for um, small business owners uh, and we said, well, you know, step one, you've got to uh, install Ubuntu, uh, and then step two, uh, you can now sell things at your flower shop. That's not really fair uh, to anyone, right? And so like when we've got an engineer who wants to just deploy some software, for me to say, well, step one, first of all, you've got to uh, fire up your own AWS instance and get Ubuntu running on it, and then you've got to get all these services. Again, not really fair, we can do better. Um, so yeah, let's just, let's just throw the whole idea of making engineers think about it out the door, because we've got tooling. Uh, another one, which was the first one that we did, is you can lock at deploy time, right? So when we roll out, and services, and we build a, build a revision for them, that's what it gets tied to. The third one, of course, is pass a header around or um, metadata on a request on whatever your request actually looks like. Um, so we're starting to get good in terms of our deployment environment, our routing environment, all that stuff. But there's still more that we can do, right? 
Um, so we want to build the client tooling up. So our, developer, our, our development environment was bad. Uh, luckily now, there are great tools to do it. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with Foreman, um, but basically it uses Heroku's proc files uh, to get multiple services up and running. Or in the case of you know, something that might run on Heroku, you might have timers, you might have a bunch of different processes that have to run. Um, Foreman's good. It's, it's, it's not the best, it's not perfect, but it certainly gets us much better there. Uh, another one that's really painful is assets, right? So what you can do is you can 12-factorize um, things. And I don't know how many people are familiar with 12-factor uh, apps, but if you hit up 12factor.net, um, it talks a lot about making apps and services standalone work happily in an operations environment. Um, we hearken a little bit to things like Docker, where you know, we're containerizing and we're working on that, but um, it's really all about working on getting that API contract solidified and concrete in between something like, you know, my application that's running, where is it going to log? I don't know. I mean, are we going to log to, like, var? Are we going to log to opt? Well, what if we just use standard out and, like, push that out onto, um, push that out onto the hosting layer? So, you know, as long as your stuff is 12-factorized, life is going to be not too bad. Um, so the lessons that we learned from this long and, and painful adventure um, was that inter-service versioning is kind of unsolved, right? And so... It's one of those things that not everybody's figured out when we've got, say, you know, two services. What are we going to do? Are we going to, am I going to have to make sure and, and version and then collectively bump my version and talk to all of my colleagues and make sure that everybody's on the same page when I, when I bump my version? And so, you know, I'll have to, like, hassle Ben to, like, stop using my uh, V1 API because we're on V3 now. Like, no, no, this is, we got to do better than that. Um, rolling deployments are pretty much required in today's world. Uh, like, there's no excuse anymore for us not to be able to do this. Um, sig, I mean, we can sig winch things, right? We've got, we've got beautiful, beautiful tools to do that. Um, and the last one that we really learned uh, with this, with all the work that I was doing, was you need to shield your engineering team from complexity. Um, you need to basically have a Heroku-style interface where I push code and it works. Uh, there can't be too much magic. Uh, I mean, like, remember early, early Heroku where they would drop a, drop a bunch of gems in and, like, it's really unclear exactly how the database works and it's a little shady. Um, you want to get rid of that magic, right? You need to make sure that when, as an engineer, when things go sideways and it doesn't work correctly, um, you need to know that you're able to debug it. You need to know that you're able to um, basically get it to work when it breaks. So... Basically, this is kind of my pseudo-closing side, is that we need to deploy better. Um, five years ago, when Heroku landed, all of a sudden, our deployment world got really nice. Um, like, we've used Capistrano, we've probably used Vlad, we've probably used a number of different tools, um, but finally this thing showed up that abstracted away so much of the complexity and so much of the pain that, I mean, I know that I deployed like 15 odd different like, like toy apps in the first couple months, right? Just like, oh man, I can put this thing on the internet? I don't have to like get some like VPC somewhere and like all of that, that pain, all of that nightmare. Um, like we're in this kind of like amazing time to be an engineer where our tools are getting so good. The, so, the APIs, the frameworks, everything is just amazing. Um, for monoliths, uh, deployment's really good. But for services, deployment still is kind of rough. It's kind of, it, it's kind of a challenge, and there's kind of a lot of work that we have to do with it. Um, the other one that we learned, of course, was that you need to minimize moving parts. Uh, like, if I roll back to that slide talking about DMV and Viaduct and, you know, the, the chicken coop out back and all that stuff, you know, we had four daemons, and we had two persistence layers, and this is just to run our software that actually does the customer's needs, right? Like, this is, this is madness. Um, so we need to minimize those moving parts. And the last one is you need to make it pluggable, right? So one of the other issues that we ran into was as time went, as you know, this stuff software got old, there was newer and shinier stuff out, right? Like we first started with Circus as our process manager, and then we used Upstart. Uh, and then we actually ran God for like two weeks, maybe three weeks. Uh, and then we wrote our own. Well, that's neither here nor there, but you know. Uh, the ability to have things modular and pluggable is going to really make all of your deployment stack and all of your deployment infrastructure much, much, much easier. Um, so I do have one more thing. Uh, uh, I've built this and open sourced it. Um, so basically, uh, I took all of the stuff uh, that we learned uh, the hard way, 
uh, writing it at Moz, uh, and with actually some of my colleagues who've done some code review uh, and talking with a whole bunch of good friends and good people, um, I've rewritten it and open sourced it. So hopefully, um, it'll work. Uh, <laughs> it's right now running a couple of my side projects. Um, it's basically a full deployment and tool chain and hosting layer for microservices. Uh, as of right now, it runs on your own hardware. Uh, my stretch goal, that if, if any luck, I'm going to get it done this weekend, uh, is to push it out on Heroku, because um, there's no reason not to, right? Like, as an end user, I should just be able to call for deploy of all of my services, and they're running somewhere on the internet. That's basically the dream, and it shouldn't have to be a dream anymore. Um, you know, it's, it's 2015. We've got amazing, amazing tools. We've got great beer. Uh, I see no reason that we can't get some great deploys. So that's it. <laughs>